Welcome to Missouri Politics. Labor Day break is over. Special session starts tomorrow. Veto session this week. Too much, too much to talk about to have a, to have a feature guest. So we're right here with the panel. Jen Burzdale, first time on the show. Missourians Health Care for All, right? Missouri Health Missouri Healthcare for All. Welcome to the show. Representative Tracy McCreary for here in St. Louis. Welcome back. Thank you. Brett Dinkins, rising political talent on the Republican side. Welcome back to the show, sir. Thanks for having me. And Michael O'Donnell, South County, St. Louis representative. Thank you for coming. My pleasure. Thank you, Scott. So you're about to go back to work this week, huh? Yeah, I'm looking forward to getting the band back together and, and seeing everybody. <laughs> so veto session seems like a bit of a yawn, right? I mean, is there a serious push to override into the vetoes? There, there really isn't. There's nothing, nothing to talk about there, but we're required constitutionally to be there. So what the governor's done is took on the time that you're going to be there anyway and set a special session. Essentially, now stop me if I'm wrong, if Missourians for years and years and years, if you trade in two cars, you trade in a trailer, a boat, and a, and a vehicle, you take that off of the, when you go to the DOR, you go to the, the driver's license bureau to pay your sales tax, you take off the purchase price of both on the sales tax, right? Correct. The Supreme Court, some judge got an idea that that's a bad thing, and so now you have to go past a special session to fix what the what the judges broke, right? Exactly right. Yeah, we're going we're going into session, and, and it should be a quick, easy Will any fix. Republicans vote against the tax cut? Well, they'll be voting uh, to raise taxes. Right. People. It's it, it seems pretty simple. And I think that's why the governor's willing to call it during special session, because it's something that we can do quickly. It's not going to be, a, you know, it's not a, a big contentious issue. It's just something that we're going into fix. But I think there's been some folks say that they, they have, some folks have said, no, you should do this special session fine, but you should also do bigger things. Some folks have said you shouldn't even have a special session over this. I got a feeling that if you have your checkbook out and you're at the license bureau and you're about to write that check, it matters to you, and you're pretty glad they're going to work this week. That's right, and I think you know a lot of people are attacking the governor over this, saying it's 3,000 people that might be affected, but that's 10 more, 10 times more people than the hometown I grew up in. Yeah, you know that's six times more than my entire school. So this is actually a lot of people, and then assuming they're married, have some kids, this is impacting a lot of local economies. If you're in Pilot Knob, this matters to you. Absolutely. If you're at Fort Davidson, this, if you're at the Fort Davidson Cafe this morning, thinking about how you're going to pay for breakfast, this matters to you. Absolutely. Now, I've seen a lot of Democrats. First, they say there's other issues to talk about, which is probably yeah. fair anytime. No matter what you pick, right. if you picked another issue, you could talk about something else. Right. Then I've seen some Democrats say this shouldn't be a special session. And I understand if you're a Democrat, maybe you think you should pay more in sales tax. But no. it's a little surprising if you're going, if you're planning to do this, if you've done this in the past and you go to the pay window at the driver's license bureau and they hit you with a bigger bill, that's going to make for some unhappy constituents. Well, I think it's a mistake to paint Democrats as being a group of elected officials that want people to pay more taxes. That's not true. This special session to me is nothing, there's nothing special about it. It's, it's the same old politics as usual. So obviously some special interest got to the governor and got the governor to do a favor for them. And we don't know who it is. We don't actually know who's behind this. But um, I think it's something that could wait until January. Do you think a special interest got to the judge? The, no. the Supreme Court changed the, no, the law. No, but we, I could list off dozens of things where there's conflict between what the courts interpret, how the courts interpret our laws and what needs to happen and be fixed. There's plenty of other more important pressing things that we should be working on. This could have waited until January. Brazil, interesting. There's uh, people go back and forth, but I, I think that there's always this lot of talk, thinking about the taxpayer, thinking about, and so Democrats advocate very effectively many times for the little person. Well, if you're a little person, now I understand maybe it doesn't affect that many people on Del Mar, right? However, if you go to Dexter, Missouri, it affects a lot of folks that may trade in a trailer and a truck, and it, it makes a thousand dollars difference. And to a lot of folks, that school clothes, groceries, that, that's going on a trip, it, it hits Missourians in the pocketbooks pretty hard. So, of course, Missouri Healthcare for All isn't working on this issue, so I don't have a real position on this particular issue. Um, but to Brett's point about 3,000 people being a lot of people, that is a lot of people. Um, 200,000 Missourians who need health care is a lot more. Mm -hmm. So, Jason, are you gonna, uh, when it comes down to vote, are you going to vote to... Of course I will, but you know I'm also from a family that has trailers and a bunch of old cars that we're working on. So you know it benefits all Missourians. It's it's the right thing to do. My point is that it could have waited until January, and there are more pressing things we should be doing. Let's talk about the pressing thing I've heard from Democrats. Uh, you've you've heard some folks reflect say, "Oh, the special session's bad. It's not worth it." And I and I I understand the argument. However, there's been some thoughtful Democrats say. Okay, fine, do this. Not a big deal. So if it's not a big deal, go ahead and do it. But also pivot to guns and crime in the city of St. Louis. Right. Well, gun violence is 
affecting every corner, not just of Missouri, but of the country. Every day about 100 people die from gun violence in this country. So, and I truly believe that there is a way to preserve folks' Second Amendment rights while making sure that people that should not have access to guns do not have access to guns. And, you know, this is about looking at this as a public safety issue. And, you know, we, we talk a lot in Jefferson City about supporting our law enforcement officers and our first mm -hmm. responders. I truly believe we need to listen to them and help them do what they need to do to make sure that the the folks that should not have access to guns that the that law enforcement can get the guns out of their hands. Ridiculous! I saw the post dispatch was so excited to the, the, the potential for new gun control laws. They caught Senator Shots and he said, "Yeah, we might look at that." So they were all oh, gun control hearings are coming. And he's like, "No, if you're looking for a gun control champion, I don't think it's going to be Dave Shots." That's right. No, uh, <laughs> Dave Shots is thoroughly committed to protecting the Second Amendment rights. But I'll say, I'm from you know I'm from Iron County, and in the Dinkins family, you get your BB gun at five, your 22 <laughs> at 10, and you get your 12 gauge at 12, and that's the way it's always been. I would argue there's probably more guns per person in Iron County, in Southern Iron, than there is in St. Louis City, you know, where I live now. And we don't have an issue with gun violence there. Um, so I don't think we can just look at and say guns are the problem. There's a lot of things going on in the cities that are impacting this, but my 12 gauge back home is not doing any anything. You can't have the battle pilot knob without a lot of guns. What do you think? I mean, that you're, I think maybe the issue that, that people don't connect, I think there's, a, there's an image in the state that there are dangerous parts of St. Louis, and the numbers would back that up, frankly. Indeed. However, I think it's an interesting thing, and, and it's not popular to admit in all parts of the state, but Porter Wagner Boulevard was built in large part with taxes coming out of St. Louis County. And there's a direct connection to the crime in the city and how it affects the county, how it affects your district, how it mm -hmm. affects people wanting to live and work and start businesses here. I think maybe sometimes the rest of the state thinks it's just a St. Louis problem. Right. And, and I think what, what's really striking us here in St. Louis is that the, the deaths of all these children is just blowing us away. And I, th I think back to, this reminds me, when I went to Iraq in 2008, we were in Anbar province in the western part of Iraq. And we, we sent more troops there and we were getting the bad guys, but it wasn't enough. Not until what we called the Anbar Awakening. When the locals got engaged, the locals got on board and they said, we don't want this element here anymore. We got, and, they, and that's when we started to make the turn. It's not just going to be police that are doing it. It's got to be the community. They've got to get engaged. The fact that we don't have suspects, somebody knows who did these things and nobody's talking and that's not a good sign. I mean, when you look at this, I always think that in the rest of the state, now it's true the rest of the state comes to St. Louis to spend money. Now, Amazon, there's things changing that, but there's a lot of the state that comes here to shop, to Christmas shop, to go to the ball game. However, the fact is, when you look at where the revenue that runs the state comes from, a lot of it's from St. Louis. It is the economic engine of the state. It dwarfs anywhere else in the state as far as putting money into the till. And this, this crime does affect. You can maybe talk about the St. Louis city and think, well, maybe, maybe not. But it, it does start to affect the county. And if St. Louis County gets a cold, the state of Missouri is going to get the flu. So we believe that every person has inherent worth and dignity. It's how the organization was founded. And any unnecessary death is a tragedy, uh, especially when we're talking about children. And of course, that affects the, the whole state. Um, one of the stories that I heard recently that absolutely broke my heart was actually not even about the kids who were killed. It's about the kids who were shot and lived. And there are kids who have been shot over the last few weeks whose families can't afford to get them the health care they need to recover. Can you even imagine your kid getting shot and now you can't get them the health care they need because you don't have health insurance? It broke my heart. The story you're saying right now honestly sounds like something you would hear late at night on an infomercial about Somalia. It, mm -hmm. it sounds like... It sounds like a third world country you're describing when you, we talk about these things. And I, I think, you know, Representative, when you, what do, if you're really breaking things down and say, well, you need gun control. Well, I, I mean, people talk about assault rifles and banning them. The, I don't read where people are getting shot in sales with assault rifles. What do you practically do to address the situation that I, I think you're not a serious policymaker if you don't see it as a problem? Well, one thing that we can do, and this is what law enforcement in the city of St. Louis is asking for, is when when they pull over somebody and see all these guns in the car, they can't take the guns away from these guys because even though they know that they're going to be used, you know, in a crime or used illegally later. So, we need to give law enforcement the tools to get guns away from people that that should not have guns in the first place. And these are people that have felons or warrants out for their arrest, things like that. You're so, one of the most serious policymakers I know in Jefferson City. Do you think that is possible? I think that the, the debate over public safety as it relates to guns is there cannot be a one-size-fits-all approach to this. 
So there's there's tactics that you can take completely unrelated to guns. I mean, there's a reason national security was set up as a goal of the federal government and not left up to state by state to figure out what they're doing. But yet in St. Louis, for some reason, we have all these little municipalities who can guard off themselves. And then the city is in its own situation. And instead of looking at some sort of uniform public safety operation that extends from St. Louis City to St. Louis County and doing policing as a whole for the entire region, instead we left everyone for themselves. And that's what's leading to a lot of the violence occurring in the city. Then you have Gardner as a prosecutor who is failing to actually prosecute these crimes and getting things done. So victims don't want to come forward because they're putting their own lives at risk. And the dysfunction between the police and the, the prosecutor. I mean, that's... that's it is. When you look at that dysfunction, if you looked at it in, in another area of business or life, you'd say, well, of course, the outcomes are going to be bad when there's that dysfunction. Right. It's interesting, though. About, about two weeks ago, I had Gussie in the car with me. I'm driving in West County. I'm reading on my phone about one of the murders of one of these children. And I, and I see the, the cop behind me. The lights are flashing, which normally means I'm going about 95 down 67 or something. In this case, I'm driving not 20 miles an hour. And I, I, I thought he was going for somebody else. Pulls me over. Says, what do you, what do you, he says, so, Scott Fawn, why did you, why did I pull you over? And usually I'm like, well, I know. I had no idea. He pulled me over for not coming to a complete stop at a stop sign. I, is there any logic to, I'm reading a story about the sixth child murdered 15 miles down the street, and out there you're getting pulled over for not coming to a complete stop at a stop sign. It doesn't make any sense. No one would design a government this way. The day after your tag expires, you're going to get a ticket if you're out <laughs> in the county. But in the city, people drive without plates. I mean, there needs to be some coordination between the county, the city, the state, the highway patrol. If we need to use the National Guard to get involved um, and help with these efforts, I mean, we need to look at that. And Governor Parsons certainly is. Uh, but there's got to be some coordination between the law enforcement, the prosecutor's office, the mayor, and state government. Do you really think that if the, that the city of St. Louis and the policymakers in the city of St. Louis want a Polk County Sheriff coming and using conservative Republican solutions to address crime in the city of St. Louis? I think that would not go over well at all. Well, I don't know, but I, I think we can all agree that we are in a crisis as yeah. it relates to this. And, you know, I, I just hope that uh, cooler heads prevail and we can figure out some common sense solutions. Because I honestly do think there's, there is got to be, there has got to be some middle ground on this that we can work on. There has to be. And this just strikes me as the type of uh, situation that's going to have a lot of discussion at the state level. It's going to have very little impact. Give me a prediction. Do you think there will be a time in the next, the next calendar year? that the Jefferson City lawmakers come together and actually send a package of help to the city of St. Louis. So I'm sorry to say that my crystal ball is broken. <laughs> She's um, just dying of knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, but I think to the basic question of can this be done, I think this is a state and a country that can do hard things, right? We put a person on the moon. We're curing more types of cancer every day. Um, I think we can address violence in our communities. I think we can find a way to get health care for everybody. Mm -hmm. I don't think we should shy away from something just because it looks hard. Is this a state problem that the state can fix? And do you think you'll actually vote on something that sends help to the city of St. Louis to address the crime problem? Well, I, I do think, so some of these deadly shootings uh, have roots in domestic violence and relationship violence, and we have made great progress, bipartisan progress, on closing a deadly domestic violence loophole that was created when we, um, Missouri became a constitutional carry state. So I am but hopeful that we point, can get that fixed. You, if you, you change these laws, though, if you have dysfunction between the cops and the prosecutors, you can write the best laws in the nation, but the, if, the, if the system is so dysfunctional, they can't enforce them, right? I mean, I, I don't know, what law could the city of St. Louis honestly look you in the eye and say, if you pass this, we can have a prosecutor and a police force that are so at odds and actually enforce it? I mean, do you, have, do you think that's a credible thing that if you write the best laws, that this dysfunctional system can actually work? Well, if we close that deadly domestic violence loophole that the legislature created in 2016, it would give law enforcement the tools to get weapons away from somebody who's been um, found guilty of, of violence. So In St. Genevieve help. County, if you write that law, I think there's a credible reason to think that St. Genevieve County law enforcement can actually enforce that law. I don't know that anybody in the world could credibly say the city of St. Louis in its current form could enforce any law. Right, and and you've got a prosecutor that's not prosecuting the, the, the crimes that the police are bringing to him. So do you think though, you're, you're, you live in South County St. Louis, I, I, when you say people don't come forward, I think there is some credibility. I, we've had people on this panel many times that say, because I'm an African American, I don't feel comfortable going to the police. I think there's the dysfunction isn't just between those two offices. It seems like the community has a dysfunction with the police force as well. Right, and and I think the the challenge here is is where's the breaking point? At some point, you look at it and say, 
you know, that's my child, you know, I'm concerned about the life of my child, it's time to speak up. But I don't know where that tipping point is, but it, it's more than just laws, it's got to be, it's got to come from the community. You're a veteran, you're somebody many people hope run for state senate, uh, you, you won a competitive district, but there's not that many in the state that you were able to win handily in South County, a place that used to vote very overwhelmingly Democratic. Are you someone, when, when you get in these rooms, what solutions, if any, do you, do you think there is a state solution that can help this problem? Because I, I think while we like to act like in the boot heel, this doesn't affect us, it certainly does. What happens in South County and the business activity there directly impacts Kennett, is there, do you think there is a state solution someone can put together to help? I, I don't, because here's the, here's the thing you, you look at. You had 13 children die and the people that committed those crimes knew exactly what the punishment for that crime was yeah. going to be. It's the most, uh, it's, it's the, the, the greatest... Um, uh, death penalty, the, right? De the death penalty. Yeah. They, they, they said they're subject to the death penalty, but they still committed the crime. We can put all the laws out there we want in the, in the, at the state level, and it's not going to change the mindset of that person. We've got to right. change that. Give community. me some Annapolis straight talk. Is there a state solution to this St. Louis City problem? Uh, the state can certainly play a role, but this comes down to a unified effort between St. Louis County and St. Louis City. We don't have that right now. It comes uh, down to a unified effort between all the entities within, from law enforcement to the prosecutor's office. Uh, but to Representative O'Donnell's point, uh, you know, the biggest deterrent to crime is thinking you're going to get caught. People only commit crimes when they don't think there's going to be any punishment for it. There's no repercussions. And that's what we're seeing now is people just getting away with this because it actually is a very low bar that you will get caught. Well, we're going to take a break real quick, but first, why don't you do me a favor? Go to shortmissouri.com. We do the history of Missouri one county at a time. I got to go down to Potosi for the Washington County, uh, county Fair. We had a great time with the Farm Bureau booth, some good friends, the commissioner. We even got the publisher of the paper there in Potosi to come out. Learned all about Washington County, talked hogs, dogs, and logs. I think you'll enjoy it. Go to shortmissouri.com. We'll be right back after this. All across Missouri, our new car and truck dealers are building strong local economies. When you buy a car or truck in Missouri, you're helping to support over 20,000 Missouri families who rely on the auto industry for good-paying local jobs. You're also helping fund our communities, schools, first responders, and our roads because dealers generate millions of dollars in tax revenue. Missouri's automobile dealers have been the foundation of our communities for generations and for generations to come. The Missouri Automobile Dealers Association, the heart of Missouri. At Ameren, Missouri, we know what light can do. It draws people together and chases monsters away. And if you shine it in the right direction, it will light the path for the next generation, showing them what their tomorrow could look like and spotlighting the possibilities that lay in front of them. Investing in our community by lighting the way forward. That's energy at work. Ameren, Missouri. Welcome back to Week of Missouri Politics. Jen, uh, I think maybe these, these stories about special session are, are, you're right, not the biggest thing in the state. I think the biggest thing, the biggest impact maybe out of this week was getting approved to put on the ballot a provision to, to expand Medicaid in the state of Missouri. Give the details of what you're doing and what that will actually affect will have on public policy here in the state. Sure. So we're thrilled that a really broad coalition from across the state has come together, hospitals, doctors, nurses, health advocates, and people, uh, to put Medicaid expansion on the ballot, and we hope to finally get it done. Uh, Medicaid expansion is about bringing health care to really hard-working Missourians who have absolutely no access right now. So for an individual, it would go up to around $18,000 a year, uh, which is around what someone would make if they worked uh, a minimum wage job full-time, you know, meaning 40 hours every single week of the year. Uh, right now, for uh, you know, an individual making $10,000 a year, $5,000 because they got laid off, there's no source of health care for them. So this gives us an opportunity to expand health care uh, to those people who desperately need it, and we hear those stories, uh, in a way that doesn't raise anybody's taxes and, in fact, brings back uh, around a billion dollars in Missouri tax dollars from Washington every year. It'll help keep our rural hospitals open and create thousands of jobs. So it's a, I call it a win-win-win. Jason McGarry, I've heard you make this point before. 
you if you do expand Medicaid, there is an economic boost. I've heard Rob Monson oh. talk about it many times. Oh yeah, it is. There is a business. Uh, there's a business equivalent to this. This is not just money you're doling out. Right. A lot of this comes back in the form of hospitals, and in most rural communities, the school and the hospital is the largest employer. Right. Exactly. Yeah. This will definitely be um, will help the economy. Not only will people be healthier, so they'll be healthier workers um, and healthier students, but it's definitely going to help the local economy. It will definitely help save some of these struggling rural hospitals yeah. and more importantly, put the brakes on rural hospitals closing. The Republicans, I think, have been reflexively anti-Medicaid expansion since it was called Obamacare. But there, are, there is a point to places like where we're from, you, you don't see hospitals anymore. Right now, even in places like Popper Bluff, you see a place where you can do some things, but a lot of it is shipping you to Cape or St. Louis. Medicaid expansion might be a lifeline to keep some of these places open and not have them cut back services. Yeah, I don't think that the goal should be, you know, how many rural hospitals can we keep open? Honestly, I'm from the perspective, and I've had these conversations with people like Doc Neely and some of these folks. I mean, that is the old method of doing healthcare, and we need to be looking to the future with telemedicine and ways we can get doctors into these rural communities on, on you know, services that can, they can provide. But this big institution of a hospital, I mean, the Iron County Hospital has struggled and struggled and struggled. Yeah. Um, and we have to be looking at new ways and not looking to the past model of doing business that way. Now, the interesting thing I've heard is we do the Medicaid expansion at the ballot, it's going to hit the budget pretty hard. It is you have to do a match for that, and that money has to come from somewhere. It is, and our budget chair, Cody Smith, has, has come out strongly against the expansion just for that fear, because at some point it starts to, it starts to cause us to look at and say, all right, we, we've got to fund Medicaid. We don't have a choice. We're, what are we going to take it from? Are we going to take it from roads? Are we going to take it from schools? Where are we going to get it? Where are we going to get the money? So that's actually untrue. Uh, even though it's true that state pays 10% of the expansion, which even that is a very small amount, that money we save in other programs that we're spending that money on now. So we have state spending at the Department of Mental Health to provide mental health care to people who are uninsured. The state covers the costs of Medicaid programs for women with breast and cervical cancer, people who it's are blind. Is it credible to say that entire match can be made up by savings, or are you saying most of that match can be made up in savings? So Washington, and economic benefit, I guess. Sure. Uh, no, but it will actually, the savings will exceed the expenditures. Uh, really? Washington University mm -hmm. researchers did a very careful fiscal analysis just this year and found that uh, I think by 2024, the state would actually come out almost a billion dollars ahead because of the savings. Well, it's uh, Brett Dings later today. Uh, Governor Parson going to be in his hometown of Bolivar. I think they had to, they were going to do the auditorium at, at the high school. Now they go out into the gymnasium. He's going to announce he's, run, he's running for a full term as governor. Uh, it looks like the stage is set. Nicole Galloway versus Governor Parson. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, Galloway is going to have a very hard race in front of her. I don't think anyone can, any reasonable person can point to a lot of gripes with the job Governor Parsons has done so far. He's been a very level head, a steady hand, and he's done a great job. And in the short time he's been there, I think Missourians are going to give him a full term and let him keep doing the job he's doing. When people are complaining that he's fixing a court decision so people don't have to pay more in their sales taxes on automobiles, you're getting by pretty good, right? Absolutely. I mean, if that's the biggest thing you can complain about right now, then he's doing pretty good. I think it's interesting. I think if, if you have Mike Parson and Nicole Galloway, uh, people are going to pick their sides. And, however, I get it. However, both, I think the state's kind of fortunate. Both of these are qualified, good people with good temperament, good judgment. The state could do worse and has done worse, frankly, than either, than either one of them. But Mike Parson goes into this race. He'll have a fundraising advantage. He is, he has the incumbent governor. Missourians tend to like incumbent governors. I, I would say if you like him and then you look at the partisan advantage, if Donald Trump's on the ballot, you have to like where Mike Parson is in the race. Right. We like where he is and we, he's a strong leader on, on our ticket. The nice thing is, is he's been an execution governor. He's set a vision, and he's he's done the things that it's taken to to get it done. And he's worked with the legislature. He's he's been been flexible, and gotten a lot of his agenda through. And I think maybe the most interesting, if you really look at Republican politics, Republican primary politics, John Ashcroft being at his event, putting That's his arm around him. I mean, to be candid, I think the top person that could have beat Mike Parson would be Jay Ashcroft. Correct. He was probably the person that Mike Parson did not want to run against in a primary. Having John Ashcroft at his event and Jay Ashcroft saying he's not running, I think probably eliminates the top contender he could have for the nomination. Absolutely. The path is clear. Mike Parson going to Bolivar. I, I think it's funny. If you really talk to serious Republicans, serious Democrats, they respect both of these candidates and, and like working with them. Everybody's going to pick their side based on their partisanship. But if you're Mike Parson, you have to like the partisan split. You have to love the fact Trump's running again. You have to feel pretty good about where you are. If you're Nicole Galloway, 
where, where do you make the margin up and how do you separate that 19 point gap at the top of the ticket? Well, I think the governor's announcement coinciding with this special session for some unknown special interest really symbolizes how that is the old way of politics and voters are disgusted with that. They are ready for something new, something fresh. And, you know, in, in all due respect to the Ashcroft family, you know, that connection to politics as usual to like just, you know, all these political connections and insiderism, you know, that's not what uh, Auditor Galloway is going to bring to this race. She's looking at to do things in a different way and not politics as usual. See, Mike Parson on the ballot, just put your political uh, strategist hat on. If you're Mike Parson, you have to feel pretty good about where you are. You'd probably rather be the Republican in this race than the Democrat in Missouri in 2020 with Trump on the ticket. So Missouri Health Care for All is nonpartisan, sure. and we know people of all political stripes want their neighbors and their neighbors' kids to have health care. Uh, I disagree that the special session is the worst thing that Governor Parson has done. Uh, we haven't spoken yet about what we call the Medicaid purge. And that is the fact mm. that since January 2018, over 100,000 Missouri children have been kicked off the Medicaid program. And the folks that are helping them try to re-enroll say that most, if not all of them, were eligible the whole time. So there are some major problems with what the administration is doing around Medicaid. Do you think that purge, though, I've, I've even heard Democrats say that it really got into this issue. It was partly a purge, but it was also partly there was a few administrations that did not remove people that should have been removed for various reasons. They moved out of the state or things. And there was some there was some technological issues. Do you think it's all just a coordinated effort to purge people? Or is it a kind of a mixed cocktail of things that came together to cause this? I'm not claiming that it was intentional, um, yeah. but when we've got kids being kicked off who were still eligible, that's a problem. Um, and I think there's a whole host of things that could be done to stop it. My question is, why is Mike Parson and his appointees, why are they spinning talking points instead of actually figuring those things out and fixing the problem? I if I saw Speaker Elijah Har took pretty quick action. Mm -hmm. said I tend to think when this report comes back, it may show that there's four or five reasons for this, right? Right. It's going to be, I think it's going to be a multitude of reasons, but, but it just are added you, are up to Are you going to commit that you address whatever, the, whatever you come back with your findings? Is there a commitment to address those? Absolutely. I Absolutely. think it's, it's I think, a solvable problem. I, right? I, and I think I think the speaker putting David Wood on the, on the task yeah. is 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 very you know, serious policy yeah, maker. Exactly. It's very genuine. With a minute left, who won the week? Uh, I have to say, Missourians who need health care won the week, and they're congratulations. Win. By the way, thank you. We're very excited, and it's the right thing to do for the state. But most importantly, it's the right thing to do for people who are working hard. Um, some of them, because while they can't get their diabetes medicine, they can't take care of their kids. Uh, so I think that's who won the week, and I am looking forward to them really winning uh, in November 2020. Is it one the week? Uh, Nicole Galloway did. I, I was really impressed that she got our attorney general to agree with her that the governor should not be able to hide information about who's visiting his office and who's trying to, you know, pull special favors in. Anyone that sleeps on Nicole Galloway's chances to win that race or making a mistake? Who won the week? Well, he's put a huge coalition together throughout southeast Missouri and has significantly outraised his opponent so far. So I'm going to say Jeff Sean won the week. Who won the week? I'm going to go with the governor and not for the normal reasons. Since we passed the bonding measure, interest rates have dropped. Uh, a great deal and we're looking at uh, construction costs going up four or five percent just by bonding we're looking at saving the state eight to twenty million dollars a year i'm gonna say somebody that everybody in the capitol will know ginger steinmetz a friend of a ton of folks in jefferson city you might come back to the capitol if you don't see some of these bracelets it's uh, go to fourocean.com ginger has started a movement she is an absolute animal lover just puts her time and her money where her mouth is these are to save uh, sea turtles different sea animals go to fourocean.com get you one you could join the movement and you could be in the in crowd next week in jeff city <laughs> we'll see if you want to be in the in crowd here come back next week and watch on this week in missouri politics This Week in Missouri Politics, sponsored by the Missouri Association of Career Fire Protection Districts, SPIRE, and Sterling Bank.